Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Shoeforia, the podcast where footwear myths are made and busted. Please follow us on all the normal social media you use, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, anything you like. Also, of course, check out our YouTube channel, which has lots of fabulous videos for you to look at, be informed, and be educated. Once again, I'm excited to bring you a fantastic guest on Shoeforia today. This is a guy I've known for many years, and in fact, we kind of lived in parallel universes for a while because while he was situated in the United Kingdom and I was in Australia, we were both doing similar things within the field of podiatry and especially in the area of pressure measurement. I'm talking about my great friend, Mr. Trevor Pryor, a distinguished podiatrist from London in England. He joins us today, and he's going to be talking to us about how he, through the years, has evolved his practice, but in particular, some very interesting stuff about the early days of using pressure measurement technology, especially the PDAR machine, to really move ahead with the way he managed his patients. He actually started out in a teaching role before he was doing podiatry. He'll tell that story. It's quite an interesting story. And he actually comes from a long lineage of podiatrists. Both of his parents were chiropodists. Trevor is really very active in the areas of both sports medicine and surgery. Quite an unusual combination there. But he's a very accomplished surgeon. But he tells me his true love really is sports medicine. Shuforia, of course, is all about footwear. And we wanted to talk to Trevor about his experience in the world of athletic footwear. And I'm here to tell you he has a lot of experience in that area. In fact, interestingly, not that long ago, he joined forces with a mate of his and he built a bespoke football boot, which cost £6,000. That's a very expensive footy boot. There's a bit more to the story that meets the eye there and he will tell the story. But basically, it folds back into his experience with laser sintering, which is, I guess, an, an early, slightly different form of 3D printing of footwear. Trevor really was right at the forefront of this back in the day when nobody really was talking about it. So he has some very interesting insights for that. And he also has very interesting insights into his thoughts on the need for custom footwear, especially in sports like football or soccer, as we would call it for elite players. I have to agree with this. I think that football boots are sadly lacking. As you've heard me say, Trevor's going to run us through how he thinks that might go. What else is missing in footwear? Well, I think he's pretty keen to drill down on boot design, and he feels that maybe there's a natural selection process for footballers to play the game because they can accommodate to the really terrible footwear that's on the market right now. A very interesting perspective. I also ask him the question, the leading question, can a running shoe be built to reduce injury? He has some very interesting thoughts on that. So without further ado, let's get into Shoeforia and this episode with Mr. Trevor Pryor. You're listening to the Shoeforia podcast by Bartold Clinical. Listen in as we delve deep into the world of evidence-based sports science, sports medicine, and athletic footwear science. Let's go and bust some myths. Welcome, everybody, to Shoeforia, the podcast where footwear myths are made and broken. And I'm absolutely delighted to have with me today a man who has become very, very well known. In fact, a bit of an icon in the profession of podiatry and a great mate of mine, Mr. Trevor Pryor, all the way from London. Trevor, welcome and thank you for getting up very early this morning to chat with us on Shoeforia. No problem. It's good to see you. You too. Hey, mate, thank you very much for sending through your bio. I read that with interest. And of course, as with all of my guests, I've done a bit of research on you. But yeah, you've been uh, you've been around the profession for a while. I read that you uh, graduated in 1903, which, uh, oh, sorry, 1983. <laughs> I'm, I'm old, but not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, the great war was quite tough. I was, was a thinking tough that you're holding up pretty well for a man of those advanced <laughs> years. But um Yeah, it's been an interesting journey and you and I have chatted in the past that you're on one side of the world and I'm on the other side of the world and it's funny that we sort of were were travelling in parallel universes for a while because I was aware of what you were doing, particularly with some of your early stuff with pressure measurement, with PDAR, 
I, you were certainly the first person that I became aware of who was using that sort of technology in a clinical sense across any profession as far as I know. Run me through that a little bit about how that all started and how you got interested in that side of things. Well, uh, when I was at college, biomechanics really wasn't much of a subject. I mean, we were told that pronation was a triplane of motion, see you later, off you go. I was lucky that my first job was in Tower Hamlets in the East End of London with Nat Paddyar, Caroline Robinson, who you guys might know who's out there in Australia now. And we all had an interest in biomechanics and it was very much the route we did Orion stuff. And we kind of self-taught quite a bit and just started doing it. Because I liked sport, when I did the postgraduate, it wasn't a degree when I trained. So I did a postgraduate degree at University of Westminster. And my uh, research study was to look at the oxygen consumption in patients with and without shin splints. And I wanted to see if we could see whether we could do anything. I mean, it was all a pretty flawed project in the end, but I had that interest. But then I started doing the surgery and as part of my surgical training, I used to visit different programs in the US each year, primarily just get experience from what they were doing surgically, but also from the diabetic foot, because that was an interest of mine. And during that process, I was having a chat with Ray Anthony, who you know, who used to run RX Labs and Biomechanics Summer School. And he was talking me about this bloke out in America that was using this pressure system to design orthotics. I thought, that sounds pretty cool. I said, who's that then? He said, well, it's a guy called Howard Dannenberg. So I just emailed Howard and said, look, I visit the States each year. Wouldn't mind coming to see what you're doing. Are you up for visits? And he he said, sure. And so off I went and uh, we hit off straight away. And what he was doing was just like, wow, (laughs) that's really cool. He was using the tech scan at the time and would do his video and the pressure analysis. He'd then get one of his nurses to design an orthotic retest and he'd have a quick look between patients and then he'd um, ring down, she'd modify until he was happy with the outcome. They'd video and then he'd go and chat to the patient. I thought, wow, that is just so good. So when I came back, I looked into the two systems and the two systems were PDAR and TechScan. And at that time, Novell had a good setup in the UK, TechScan perhaps not so much. And I was advised that the PDAR was scientifically probably a little bit more robust. So I invested and that was probably 1995. And as I'm sure you're aware, Howard's expertise is lower back pain. And one of the first patients I looked at, I actually, I bought all the materials he used. Uh, <laughs> I did everything. I had a patient I was absolutely certain we could help with uh, lower back pain. I've made her some temps. It helped for a day and then no good. So I spent about three hours with this woman just keep trying to change the orthoses to improve the function. And nothing I did made any difference. So I said to at the end, I said, you know what? <laughs> Orthotics aren't going to help you. You need to go and sort your back pain out. And she thanked me. And it was the first time anybody had ever thanked me when I told them I couldn't do anything for them. And it was because she saw that I tried everything. And rather than sending her away, come back in six weeks, I'll stick another bit on here. You come back in six weeks, I'll stick another bit on. And we did one session and off she went. So we just started using it more and more. And we started to realize that we would look at someone's foot structure and function, have an idea about what we thought it might do. We'd look at it with the PDAR and saw that the foot was loading in a different way which kind of intimated to us that it was something outside the foot that was influencing function. And therefore, we could start to see the patients that we felt we could help with orthoses, those we thought we were less likely to help and needed to be referred on. And it just kind of completely transformed practice, really. Yeah, it's a really, I mean, it's an interesting tale that it's so long ago, back in, the, we're talking 25 years ago now, that that you guys were really looking at a lot more than almost anybody else was looking at most people then were looking at the angle of the dangle and a correct vertical model, which of course we now know is highly flawed. And what you guys are doing is test retest, which not many people do very well. And I think that's great that you actually cotton on to the fact that it was a lot more than just trying to correct an angle. And it was more about trying to shift a force or a load on a structure. But, but moving back well, sorry, I, should, I should qualify because I wouldn't want to mislead him. We were still doing angles and dangles at that time. Yeah. But was we were Howard? very much – was Howard? Probably not. I mean, I think we used it a lot for trying to work out whether or not we felt the foot function was contributing to the problem or whether it was something outside the foot or a combination. Mm. Our approach to designing the orthoses was – to a large extent, still a bit angles and dangles, although our modifications became different because of what we saw on the pressure analysis, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like kind of transition, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. I mean, you're a couple of years ahead of me. I think I I bought my PDAR system in 1998 or something like that, but 
I tell you, Trev, that you did actually inspire me. So uh, it was my competitive nature of being a colonial. I didn't want the palms to get the better of me, so I thought I'd better go and buy a bloody uh, pedo machine. But, you know, going back even further, it's quite interesting that way when I did a bit of research here and with your bio that despite the fact that, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think both of your parents were chiropodists, uh, the early version of podiatrists, but you started out your professional life as a teacher. So your first degree was in teaching. Did you ever teach? No, actually. So in terms of that, the bio's probably come out slightly wrong. So what happened was, no, I went straight from school. Can I just to, interrupt? There's always a story with Trevor. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Okay, go on. I went straight from school to Coropoly College, partly because my school wouldn't let me do a maths degree. So I had to do maths physics and chemistry. I didn't really do the work, didn't get the grades. Dad said, what are you going to do? I said, no idea. He threw in the term paramedic somewhere. I thought it was pretty cool. So bit of nepotism. He got me an interview. They gave me an unconditional. I did no more work, failed my A-levels, ended up at Coropoly College. And towards the end, as we were finishing, I was quite interested in teaching at the college. And I asked the head of school at the time whether or not there would be any jobs. And he kind of fobbed me off. He said, go and get a teacher qualification. I might listen to you. So I said, all right then. So (laughs) I left college in the July and enrolled on a teacher qualification in the September. Got that the first year and went back to him and said, right, I've got the qualification. Now I went, oh, all right, <laughs> we'll give you a part-time job. So I probably started part-time teaching second year after I qualified and the amount of teaching I did with them kind of increased slowly over a period of time. And at one point, probably around about 1990, I did toy with going into a teaching post. I was more interested in a kind of 50-50 split teaching and clinical and in fact, it was that was a kind of crossroads. A kind of your careers have crossroads. And at that particular time, the job came up for teaching. I'd been offered a big private practice in Highgate, which is a good part of town, and I was considering the surgery. I didn't want to do full time. I did do a job share interview with someone, but they were interested in full time, so they got it. And then I asked my boss if he'd support me to do the surgery, and he said, "Yeah." So off I went on the surgical route. So, uh-huh. yeah, I, I taught at Chelsea, the old Chelsea school, for up until it closed. And obviously now I'm very fortunate. I have a senior clinical lecturer post at QMUL in London in the sports med department. Yeah, that's a good gig for sure. So one of the things that interests me is you've obviously been very involved in sports medicine over the years. And I know you have great passion for sport, especially your, especially your beloved rugby. And I've been taught that rugby is rugby and rugby league is a completely different sport, although I don't understand either of them. But Rugby league is American football without the padding. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was I was told that rugby is a sport of thugs played by gentlemen and that rugby league is a sport of gentlemen played by thugs, but that may, may not be the case. Now, <laughs> now, we, we, we do that to football over here, so football's the, the rugby league. <laughs> right, right, Soccer. right. You've also got quite a distinguished career in, in surgery, and that's a quite a quite an unusual combination to be able to be successful in both clinical sports medicine and surgery. It interests me because obviously the thought had crossed my mind over the years as to whether or not I should be doing surgery, but I always I always sort of felt that my brain was pretty much full and that I couldn't absorb anything more, I, so I just focused on sports medicine. But what's your real passion, Trevor? Is it hard to say or do you have a bit of a leaning more towards sports medicine or, or more towards surgery, which do you enjoy most? I think most of my colleagues that know me over here would know it's probably the sports medicine, really. You know, yep. when, when I wake up and you have a little idea and stuff, then you go and have a look at something. I'll, I'll look probably more towards sport than I will do the surgery. At the time when I decide to do the surgery, I mean, you have to kind of think about healthcare systems and stuff like that as well. So I was largely working in the NHS. There wasn't much of a private practice for, for surgery, but in the NHS to get on, surgery was clearly going to be the way forward. Uh, a bit like you and the PDAR, I wasn't going to get left behind. So if the profession was moving down that route, then I was moving down that route as well. And actually, if you think about it, a lot of what we do surgically is kind of biomechanical. Some of the concepts, and it's quite interesting they talk about planal dominance and stuff like that, because actually what really happens is you talk about the plane of deformity or the compensated plane rather than the plane that's causing the deformity, which is which is quite interesting. But yeah, so I did the surgery and I mean, it just taught me so much. I mean, mm. doing the anatomy and from an education perspective, it took me much further. And plus, you're, you're now talking to people with a different kind of philosophy, 
different kind of approach to patients. So you, you learn something. So I could take my surgery to sports medicine and my sports medicine to surgery. And now I'm starting to get a few colleagues that will refer me patients to, to do some analysis to give them an idea about either why someone's had a problem post-surgery or whether or not they should go ahead with surgery. Great case, actually, a couple of weeks ago, a lady who's got had a Alex resist and she's had surgery on one side and not the other side, and she was um and ring. And actually, we could demonstrate with the PDAR quite nicely how the side she's had surgery on is functioning better than the side she's not had surgery on, and that kind of makes the decision for her. So Yeah, yeah, that's good. I, I know uh, my great mate, Andrew Venison, who actually does similar things in podiatry as you, he's always said that the, the gift that surgery brought him was his knowledge of anatomy, and it just... Uh, yeah. He thinks that that's been very, very beneficial for him. Now, listen, mate, this is Shufuria, so we're supposed to be talking about uh, sports footwear. And, and one of the reasons that I wanted to get you in on the podcast is because you have actually had a very significant involvement in athletic footwear over the years. And, in fact, you are a director in a company called P2L, which way back in 2006 built a bespoke footwear boot called the – what was it called, Trev? The Assassin. The assassin, that's the one, the <laughs> silent assassin. And it was marketed as being the world's first bespoke football boot. And I don't know whether this is true or not, but I just read a web page on this boot and it said that the cost of the boot was, drum roll please, £6,000. Now, is that correct? <laughs> well, yes, but no, but... Um... <laughs> So interesting story. I mean, you could very much, if I was really honest, that football boot was probably the concept car of the football boot world. And it kind of came about, I was working with West Ham through most of the 90s. And there was a, a lad that was doing a performance sportswear design course at Loughborough who wanted to do something on football boots. And he contacted the FA and the FA pushed him my way. So he came and spent a day with me talking to me, saying what he wanted to do. And, you know, like you get loads of people come in and you talk to them. And I kind of think in any profession, if you take 10 people, you'll get eight people that are good at what they do. You'll get one person who works really hard and becomes really good. And then you'll get one person who just has it. He's the one in 10, in the words of UB40. I know not the right analogy, but it is one in 10. And this guy struck me as a one in 10. He just had that little something. And he said he wanted to make a football boot. So I'm like, okay, I'm up for that. And um, I was chatting through with the physio at West Ham at the time. He said, oh, it'd be really cool if you could incorporate any orthotic -y type stuff in the boot. Because as, as you all know, is all the footballers wear the boots, cut the size is too small. So everything's out of place. You can't put much in there at all. And it's all a bit of a nightmare. So we went from sort of designing a boot that initially what we wanted to do was make it tight so they got the feel, but a better fit. That was our initial aim. But then it was like, okay, well, how can we then make a stub plate that's molded, right? And so you look at injection molding and that's like three grand a foot to create a mold and or it certainly was at the time. And back then that was a lot of money. And that's not practical for one person unless they really want to lay out on it. So we had to look at other things. So we did a bit of work with Formula One, believe it or not, looking at carbon fiber and see whether we can make a stub plate out of carbon fiber. Of course, that delaminates. And then at the time, we came across something that was completely new to me, which was SLS, so the laser sintering. And all of a sudden, we sort of had this kind of process that was, wow. <laughs> when Greg explained to me what it was, and I talked to a couple of people, I said, the only limitation with that technology is our imagination. I mean, you could do uh, anything I might you just, want. I might just interrupt here for a moment because there'll be a ton of people who don't know what laser sintering is, but it's essentially the precursor to 3D printing. It's a slightly different technique, and it still exists, actually, but there'd be a future if you don't know what it is. So sorry for that interruption, but carry on. Yeah, so, well, to elaborate on that, basically you get dust parts and the laser welds it together according mm -hmm. to the computer program. So you can make something that's got a hinge, but it's just one unit instead of two units. And it was like, Wow. Greg started working with this and we, we made a couple of prototypes and then we hooked up with a guy who had a patent on a particular kind of stud design. It was, it was a blade sort of design. And then we worked with um, one of the England ladies, footballers. So the process was that I would do my clinical assessment, include, including PEDA. We'd make her some orthoses, check them with the PEDA. She would use them, make sure she's comfortable with them. Then we would convert that into the stud plate. So you get an individual last, and then we build, we, we actually use kangaroo skin for the leather. And Greg had developed a process of being able to print onto the material. 
So when we first used it, I actually think we were the first people to use it for a product. And I presented at the Laser Sintry National Conference and we got an award for this presentation. It seems incredible looking back on it now. But we made this this product for um, Katie, her name was. She said, that's the most comfortable shoe I've ever worn. Mm-hmm. So not boot, but shoe. Because now you can make it to the dimensions. And we did this big launch at the London College of Fashion and anybody who knows anything about football, we got a guy called Ray, Ray Butch Wilkins who uh, played for Chelsea United in England and was one of my heroes. So it was quite nice to get up. And uh, I actually said, if you had told me when I was an 18-year-old kid that one day I'd be stood here introducing Ray Butch Wilkins to talk about a football that I designed, you'd have to pinch me 15 times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> First thing he said was, I haven't been called Butch Wilkins for a long time. <laughs> we did this big launch. And um, the problem was at the time, that we had, in order to do each component, we had to use lots of different people. So it wasn't going to be in one house. And we were probably a bit naive as well in terms of now we would probably do crowdfunding. That wasn't around at the time. So it kind of got to a stage where it sort of became a bit impractical. Money wasn't coming in. So Greg went off and worked for lots of different football boot companies. And funny enough, we just started the process again towards the end of last year. So we had in production the next level of boot and COVID come along and obviously a couple of the factories have shut down and da da da. So we're, we're in transition at the moment. Right. Yeah, it's, it's certainly devastated the footwear industry. It's, uh, it's just the, uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. That's an interesting story, mate. And I've had a look at the boot and it certainly was an interesting boot from um, 14 years ago, but what do you think are the challenges with football boots in 2020? What's missing? What's lacking? For if you take professional football, they should truly have custom boots. Right now, they'll argue they don't get the injuries, et cetera, et cetera. But the amount of detail that they pay to every other aspect of it and just say that the way that they custom a boot for the majority of them, probably not all, but for the majority of them is to just say, well, which stub plate do you like and which upper do you like? Yeah, we'll mix them together for you. We might stick a heel lift in or something like that. I mean, I, I listened to um, your podcast with Martin, which were absolutely fascinating. And towards the end of the second one, you started talking about the um, carbon fibre plates and the toe spring and stuff for football boots. And what was fascinating, for, what I think the challenge with a stub plate is, is, is we know that if you take a sprinter, that the flexibility of the spike will have an effect on speed, but the flexibility is individual. So what works for one person doesn't work for another. So if you take the Nike 4%, for instance, well, that will work for a percentage of people, but not necessarily optimal for everybody. The responders and the non-responders, as we call them. Well, interesting, so, you know, I, I digress very slightly. We, As you know, we do some 3D analysis as well. And I have a lady who's used a range of different shoes. But when we looked at her in the 4% compared to the next percent, right, there was different function. And she preferred the 4% to the next percent. And Mm -hmm. you start to look at the toe spring and the heel height between the two shoes. They are different shoes, Mm -hmm. right? And the next percent just didn't suit her. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the boot, firstly, you should be able to optimize the rigidity or flexibility of the sole certainly in the sagittal plane, in order to optimise function. The next bit is, so for a particular lad that we're making this boot for, he has a problem with inversion injuries. And one of the ways that, as I'm sure you know, the traditional way would be some kind of lateral wedge on an orthotic, which I know the forces, but there's a mechanical issue I have with it in, in certain people. So what we've played around with with orthotics is making the lateral border of the orthotic stiff and the arch area flexible so that you're playing around with the moments by changing the flexibility. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't do that in a stub plate. Yep. And that's exactly what we did. We tried the orthotic with him, and now we're going to make the stub plate that does exactly the same thing. But now if you take a someone like him who's got a fairly broad foot, if he has a stud plate that's smaller than the contact area of his foot, it's mm-hmm. going to make him unstable. Mm-hmm. So he needs that stub plate that's wider, right? But if he has a wider stub plate, Because of the way you do it on a general last, you end up with huge volume, so you don't get feel for the ball. So what you now do is you change the upper to go with the stub plate, right? In theory, you could change the flexibility and stiffness through the length of the stub plate to change the way that it interacts with the foot, depending on what part of the stance phase, whether up on the ball or the foot, that type of thing. 
And that, to me, I think that's fascinating. Well, that's not even theory. That's actually practice right now. And, and I think that one of the things that's fascinating me is, yes, I agree with you, you know, sort of at the elite end of the game, the players should be having custom-built shoes. I mean, I had the discussion with, with Dina Castor only a couple of weeks ago about running. And she said, yeah, look, there's not a top elite runner who doesn't have their shoes bespoke built for them. They're all made for us. So I don't quite understand why that wouldn't be happening with, I call the game soccer because football is a true and great sport of Australian rules, of course. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, you know, the thing now that people may not understand is you can 3D print a last from biometric data. So you can take a laser scan in your clinic and you can do all this stuff now and you can you can pretty much do whatever your imagination will allow you to do. And it's not that expensive anymore. And it's accelerating very rapidly. I don't think we're going to see 3D printed boots or shoes anytime soon, but we will see componentry for sure. Yeah, so I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, do you think, I know we've had this discussion before, but one of the things that puzzles me a little bit is that we also, all athletic footwear is made as a mirror image. So the left shoe is a, a mirror image of the right shoe, and there are very few people who have mirror image feet. And that's another good reason why maybe we should be looking at some of these processes you're talking about. Got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on the degree of asymmetry. I mean, again, if we go back to, we could say elite, but let's just say we take a good level footballer who's fit, right? And invariably, if we're looking at the younger generation, one of the things that the PDAR taught us, so obviously I used the PDAR on, I couldn't even tell you how many footballers that we've used the, the PDAR on and looked at the interaction of boots, et cetera. And what was really interesting is that when you look at certainly the pressure analysis, these lads are so fit that they actually compensate so well for any imbalances that you see very few changes. They're very subtle, the changes you see compared to, you know, if you took someone who was born in 1903. Like yourself. <laughs> referring back to your <laughs> the, um, So they could cope with that. Now, the problem obviously becomes then when they become injured and whether or not that inputs on their recovery. And of course, like, when do we see players we see players when they're injured so we don't see what they were like before we see the consequences and and that's where i feel screening sometimes has a role to play not not that you're going to try and prevent injury but if they get an injury you can look at see what they were like before what they're like after and therefore have that kind of information but i think the issue becomes is that with the multi-directional nature of football the relevance of the kind of interaction of how the boot functions and that kind of biomechanics is perhaps not quite as important as it might be in a running shoe, which is unidirectional and so repetitive, right? And and we now talk in the runners, don't we? Right, we talk about good strength, getting the right strength and doing the right rehab, all right? Well, the footballers have been doing the right rehab and strength all the time and not really worrying about the boot because they expect the boot to hurt. Yeah, it almost sounds to me like there's a degree of natural selection for a footballer that they basically, they get sort of funneled into the game because they can't, I mean, I, look, I'll be quite honest here, I think football boots are the crappiest piece of footwear in the universe. I just don't think <laughs> they've evolved at all. I think they're primitive. I think they, more than any other piece of equipment, they cause injury in sport, which is not something you can say about most shoes in sport, but football boots actively contribute to injury. And it stuns me that we haven't moved on with our design protocols for football. But it may well be, as you said, you said something very interesting a moment ago about how they do sort of adapt. And it may well be that there is this sort of selection process where you can either cope with, with that sort of footwear or you can't. And if you can't, then you don't make it to the top echelon. But it's a nice little segue for me to talk, to move from football, which is a passion of both of ours, but to move to running and just get your thoughts on what we're seeing right now. Obviously, we're in the era of the super shoes and we're seeing every company now, um, even some quite obscure companies are building their rocker sold Home field carbon fiber reinforced footwear. Trev, what are your what are your thoughts on where it's all going? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, when you look at the different shoes, I've just received my Hoka Carbon X. Yep. that came through, and um, being the first pair I've ever worn, wow, <laughs> what a difference in the gait they cause. But they've all got kind of what we don't. I kind of did a little search around to look at some of the kind of measures and and. Martin was talking about how their review process started talking about stack height and all that kind of stuff. And you can get that information, but they won't tell you much about the carbon fiber plate itself and uh, the toe spring and things like that. And if you look at the different shoes, 
the amount of material between the carbon fiber plate and the ground and the amount of carbon material between the carbon fiber plate and the foot all varies. Poker, for instance, is traditionally a low profile shoe. So they're all going to be different. It's probably a bit too soon, if I was honest, to be able to make some comments. I mean, I've, I've already alluded to this lady with the 4% and then the next percent, how that differed to them. Since I've been using the 3D analysis, I've worried a lot less about footwear. I have to confess. I mean, I, a bit like you, I'm sure back in the day, I was hard nosed about the type of shoe someone should have. When I was told that if you had an orthotic, you needed a neutral shoe, I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense because of physics. A neutral shoe will give way more, so put it in a firm shoe. If you, my, my comment always used to be is people that tell you you need an orthotic in a neutral shoe are the people that haven't got the balls to put an orthotic in a stability shoe. You know, <laughs> because they, yeah. they're, they're kind, of, kind of trying to negate some of the benefit. I mean, now I fully realise what's a really interesting thing we see on the 3D is that as you stiffen up the shoe or put an orthotic in, you invariably reduce tibial rotation. Mm-hmm. So you make things stiffer. And mm-hmm. if you don't, what happens is, if, it, for instance, if you put an orthotic in a shoe that can give, you see that the shoe gives more because we measure shoe deformation. And often the tibial rotation follows it. So you get an increase in tibial rotation because the shoe collapses and the leg follows it. So because we're seeing generally injured runners, we're looking to use the shoe maybe just to help in that process. We might use something like a hoka to encourage a midfoot strike. But a bit like everything, you take, if I give you a single case history of myself, I'm not much of a runner. I have run over the years. The year before last, I did a lot of posterior chain work because I wanted to run a bit more and I'd been getting a few problems. And I started running few things happened. I stopped and I did it during lockdown. I did everything I tell my patients not to do. My daughter's boyfriend said, fancy going for a run. And I sort of rolled it, but yeah, yeah, I could do that. So when I got to about nine and a half K and my hips were minging, I said, I'll have to walk the rest, <laughs> rest of the way home. I'll give it a week, let that settle down. I'll try another 10 K and then my right arch and something else started to hurt. And then next run, I thought, oh, I'll tell you what, I won't use my structure shoe. I'm feeling a bit stiff today. I'll take my orthotic out. I'll tell you what I do is I, I, I use the Ciccone because that was just a little bit of vibration. Went out there, blooming it. <laughs> yeah. Dude, so, everything so, I'm a practice not to do. So the point I was trying to make was that having one shoe is probably unrealistic. Okay. All shoes are going to change the function. You have to kind of understand what they're doing and allow your body to adapt to them. Yeah. I think that it's a really good point. I mean, one of the things that people may not have gotten onto quite yet is that despite the fact we've got this new group of shoes being called the super shoes, they are, as you've pointed out, completely different in terms of configuration. The plates, the foams are different. The shape of the plates are different. The drops and stacks are different. Even their designated use is different for different shoes. So I think that anybody who's expecting that they just go out and immediately match a shoe and your analogy with the 4% versus the the next percent is very interesting. They're, they're quite different shoes. They're different at many different levels. But one of the key questions here for you, mate, which is is like one of the, the holy grails of the footwear industry, is do you, Trevor Pryor, believe that a running shoe can be built such that it will prevent injury? No. Okay. You don't want to think about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> one running shoe, what injuries? I mean, I know I've seen the data that, x percent and whatever but i mean how can one shoe when we look at the diversity of the people using the shoes right and i'll qualify so that people know and when i talk about 3d i'm involved in the 3d business so i always do that right but i have my views about biomechanics that were colored by the pressure analysis that that sort of opened my mind a lot and i thought i knew quite a bit when we started using the 3d in clinic it kind of blew me away I was just like, wow, I didn't even consider this right. To the extent, I actually think the sagittal plane is probably the key plane. And depending on a number of factors will depend on whether you are ankle, knee or hip dominant for driving function. Depending on factors around that, there will be patterns of function within that. And that is so variable between the individuals, it's almost impossible to get one shoe that's going to do that. And the shoe is just one factor in the component. And I I might might just interrupt you here and say, I think that you're taking a very kinematically biased view of this. Uh, What about the kinetics? Because yeah, so we can't measure kinetics with the system we have. However, what are kinetics? Kinetics are the joint moments are down to where the center of pressure is and where the joint is. 
So the kinetics are determined by the kinematics. So if we can get a load of different kinematic profiles, we'll get different kinetic profiles. Right. So that, well, that's the, the reverse is true, though, as well. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm not divorcing that. I'm using yeah. kinematics as an example for the diversity between yeah. patients. Yeah. Right. And uh, very subtle differences in strength and flexibility could change the kinetics, which may not change the kinematics. Yeah. Right. But if we just add that in as another complexity in the factor, that makes it even more unlikely that one shoe is going to be the elixir for every person. And then you have the level of Irene talked in her podcast about natural cushioning and forefoot, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when we were forefoot and barefoot, we were endurance people because we were chasing those animals. We weren't distance over speed. We were mm. endurance over time, mm. right? So for people to be able to be a forefoot striker, for instance, they have to have really good strength to do that. Absolutely. And even if they want to be a heel striker in shoe X, if they want to exercise to level A, right, they probably have to do a rehab and a strengthening program level to level B. Now, if they're not prepared to do that, then they either have to accept that exercise in level A is probably going to cause them to get injured or they have to change their aspirations. And if they want to go further, then they have to train to go further. And part of that's adaptation. And therefore, the whole huge of people that I see won't be prepared or have the time to do the degree of rehab they need to do to yeah. do what they want to do. And that's then when you start to use shoes and orthotics and stuff to supplement the process to try and buy them a bit more. Yeah. I'm going to play the devil's advocate here and say I, I understand exactly what you're saying and I agree with it to a point. But as you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at vibration and I've seen a lot of interesting things. And I think we're moving to a point where because we understand how much vibration influences fatigue and we understand how much fatigue influences kinematics and we understand that vibration also affects tissue, and we now know that you can shift the amplitude or the frequency of a vibration away from the point of resonance of a tissue, I think we will see a point where shoes will be able to prevent injury, especially in things like Achilles tendinopathy. Not for everybody, but I think we will be able to see a clear influence of the shoe because if we know the Achilles tendon resonates at between 10 and 30 hertz or its vibration is at 10 and 30 hertz and we can avoid resonance, so we can shift it either from 30 hertz and above or 10 hertz and below, then uh, you have a real chance of protecting that tissue and also, as I said, the, the impact on fatigue. You know, when just before I left Solomon, and it's no secret now because I think they've published some data on this, they achieved a four decibel reduction in input vibration in a running shoe. Now, four decibels is like, I don't know, that's like scoring 30 goals in, in soccer. It's a massive, massive reduction in vibration. So if you can do that, that almost certainly is going to have an effect, I think, on potential for injury or even injury in the future. So it's a bit of a brave new world where uh, we're working here now, mate. I'm on the fence. So I, I completely understand what you're saying, but I do, I do think there's some very interesting things out there that may well, may well revolutionise how we look at footwear in the next few years. Mate, I think I've covered everything I want to talk to. I mean, there's lots of things I like to talk to you about, but I'm very aware of the time. We're up to 40 minutes on this interview, and that's 10 minutes more than we usually do. So I might let you go and have some breakfast. You're not going to have any baked beans, though, are you, because they're just too high in <laughs> sugar? Really I've had my smoothie and bulletproof coffee already. Is that it for breakfast? Yeah, actually, uh, generally I would just have the bulletproof coffee, but um, when I'm sitting and working at home, sat down, you seem to get hungrier. No, you've got to have a you've got to have a boiled egg, some smoked salmon, some avocado, and maybe a couple of cherry tomatoes, mate. And then you'll be good. You'll be good for the day. You won't need to do anything till dinner time. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, you're a big lad, so you might need a bit more than me. All right, so Trevor Pryor, it's been fabulous to talk to you. I actually might even tap you on the shoulder for another chat later on because I think we've only scratched the surface of this. There's a there's a lot of knowledge there, and I've found this really interesting and. And also quite controversial in a number of different ways. So I'm really intrigued with your point of view. But let me just say thank you, mate, for your time, for getting up early for me. And I'm sure that people listening to this uh, podcast will get a lot out of it. So thanks very much for you, for coming on the show, Trevor. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Good on you, mate. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us for the Shoe Foria podcast by Bartold Clinical. Join us next time 